Welcome to uh, this week's uh, seminar will be given by Dr. Kendall Lamke. Uh, everyone knows uh, Dr. Kendall Lamke very well. Uh, I actually encourage all the grad students to go to the department website. There's a copy of his CV. Uh, if you read the detailed CV, you get to learn uh, the professor better. Uh, we only summarize a few key uh, achievements Kendall has made so far. Uh, he is a professor and chair of the Department of Agronomy. Uh, Kendall has been with us since 1984 after graduating with a PhD degree, uh, worked at ARS until 2002, and then as a faculty uh, from 2002, but stayed as a research faculty 2006, and then switched to as a interim department chair, and then department chair until now, it's about 38 years. Uh, he has trained about 18 PhD students, 10 master students. That's a huge number, considering in the last 15, 16 years, he hasn't been doing, he has been doing less research, but more administration. Uh, that's a huge number to, to, to accomplish during our career as a faculty. Uh, Kendall has also uh, co-authored about 81 refereed journal publications, has served as the editor for crop science, uh, he was elected to be fellow of uh, ASA and the CSSA. Uh, the major research achievement has been the you know, quantitative genetics of selection response, inbreeding depression, and heterosis. Uh, he was awarded the 2020 National Association of Plant Breeders Public Sector Plant Breeding Impact Award. The award ceremony was held on August 19, virtual uh, 2021 at the NABP meeting organized by Cornell University, where Kendall gave a short presentation. Uh, today, we invite him to expand on that short presentation, uh, especially to benefit our internal graduate students, uh, faculty, uh, to listen to his achievement and his thoughts about 40 years of agronomy and plant breeding. Let's welcome Kendall Lamke. Thank you, Jin Ming. Well, it's a pleasure everyone to be here. And uh, let me get my, let's get the right screen going here. Gosh, we just went through all this. Now I can't get my, uh, oh, let's yeah, see what's going on. I can't get my mouse off my other screen to get to my, my slides to move. Jeez, we've been sitting here all this time. Oh, there we go. Is that working? There we go. Excellent, sorry about that. So, so thanks everyone um, for coming today. And I, I got some thank yous myself. I, I really need to thank Jin Ming. Um, and um, for a bunch of reasons. One, he's been organizing plant breeding uh, seminar now for a couple of years, maybe three years, time flies and you're having fun. And I also appreciate the, um, <clears throat> the community atmosphere that Jin Ming's been trying to bring to the, to the plant breeding program and, and making sure everybody's engaged. That, that, that's, that's really a big help. And of course, I need to thank him for nominating me for the uh, NAPB Public Impact Award. It's, a, it's I feel... Um, well, I feel there's a lot of, I know a lot of plant breeders who deserve the award way better than me. And so I'm really grateful to have gotten the award. And so, so it means quite a bit to me. I'm, I'm not a big award fan in general, but this is a, a special award, especially since I spent the last 15 of my years not doing plant breeding, directly anyway. I've had some influence. So I really do appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you coming here today too. And so that's, that's really special. Um, you know, my, my first mess. Can, can, can you share the slide? Oh, they're not shared anymore? Not yet, yeah. Oh, shoot. I'm, I apologize. I um, thought we had all this straightened out. There we go. Is that Wonderful. Working? Yes. So for some reason, then, there we go. I got my mod thing over there. All right. Yeah. So the first thing I want, first point I want to make is, is uh, nothing happens in a vacuum. And that's the, um, the, the point of my, my whole seminar here today is that nothing happens in a vacuum. Uh, to one's career, I don't think. And I want to thank all the, all the faculty and staff associated with plant breeding in our department. This is, a, this is a picture of the ones, at least, I didn't update this picture if it's changed, but uh, <clears throat> that are associated with plant breeding in our program. And I, I really do appreciate all of them, you know, and I, I know 
as the chair, you know, they, everybody may always be happy with what we've done, but um, but I think it's been a great group. And and if any of us have accomplishments, it's partly due to the group effort, right? And so, and and what everyone's doing and contributing to the program as we move forward. I, I really do appreciate that. And it's a lot of fun to work with everyone and what they're doing. So I'm not gonna go back too far in history. So this is kind of a historical thing for me, a little bit about my history. Um, I was talking with the staff person about this. I feel that everything that's happened to me over time has been, um, it's just sort of happened. I, I just lost the word I wanted to use. But I, I went to the University of Illinois to, uh, as, for my undergraduate degree reluctantly. I really didn't want to go to college. And I, and I think, um, you know, and I you run into more people now where they've really got their careers planned out, but I didn't have my career planned out. My goal in high school was to farm. And, um, and that's what I thought I'd end up doing. But at the time I uh, graduated in high school, the farming situation wasn't working out that way. And so I had to do something. So my everybody thought I should go to college. And so I went to the University of Illinois. And I started out majoring in ag engineering. And what's interesting about that, given the fact that I'm now chair of agronomy department, is I didn't know agronomy existed and, uh, when I went to the University of Illinois. In fact, I didn't know it existed until I'd been there almost a year and a half. Um, and I think that's an interesting thing. And that's one of the reasons we have this I'm an agronomist campaign and, um, and where we've been trying to explain what agronomy is. And, um, I, and I may have been living under a rock as a kid. I'm sure I was. Um, but anyway, so I, so I got a chance to go to the University of Illinois. I spent four years there, got my BS degree in agronomy. I switched into agronomy uh, my junior year. And serendipitously, uh, it turned out the director of the undergraduate programs in agronomy at that time was a guy named Daryl Miller. And Daryl was an alfalfa breeder. He, was the, he ran the undergraduate programs. And so I asked him what he did. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And my goal in life was to, if I couldn't farm, then what I wanted to do was impact farmers. And that's still one of my goals in life. Uh, that's been my goal here as department chair too, is I think we ought to be impacting farmers, the practitioners of agronomy and the users of plant breeding. And, um, and those are the people who ultimately benefit uh, from what we do as plant breeders and agronomists. And so, and so then I thought, well, that's pretty cool. And, and he told me I should talk to John Dudley and I'll get to that in a minute. And then the next thing you know, I was working in a plant breeding program. I thought, well, this is pretty cool. It might be something I'd be able to do. And it met, met my goal of, um, of being able to impact farmers at that time. Um, that's about the only goal I had though, um, besides having a good time in college. And I did. And so then I, then I ran into John Dudley and um, I started working for him as an undergraduate. Uh, he took the risk, I would say, of taking me on as a graduate student and, um, eh, in 1980 after I graduated from college. And, uh, and as part of this, part of my story about this is, is that Dr. Dudley has roots in, at Iowa State University. And uh, at the time that didn't matter to me, right? I didn't know too much about Iowa State at that point in time, but he got his master's here with C.P. Wilsey, who was the alfalfa breeder at Iowa State in 55 and his PhD in 56, which is, believe it or not, before I was born. And I know that's hard to believe. And, uh, and, and so he, he agreed to be my, my advisor. And, um, and, so, and I, so I started graduate school in the summer of 1980 with Dr. Delty working on my master's and not knowing what I was gonna get into. And so before I go there, um, we, part of the story is, is that you know, when I started graduate school with him, I had no idea what to do. And I got put in a room with a whole bunch of other graduate students, some of them who, who some of you may know, you know, they all went on to do other things. Uh, two of them that come to mind immediately are Mark Mesmer, who ended up you know, fairly high up in the Garst hierarchy at the time. And then I think he ended up retiring from um, Monsanto. And the other person would be Bob Miller, um, who, who worked at various companies, but runs a seed company now called Miller Hybrids over by Iowa City. Some of you may, I know some of you know Bob. And so, um, but they be, both became pretty good friends of mine. And, uh, and that's the other part about this is, is that I hadn't realized at the time, and, and I certainly do now, how small the community is. And, and how we all go to school together. Um, and, we'll, and we can come to some of that in a minute. So then what, um, and here's a, just a picture from Dr. Dudley that we had, a, we held a long-term, well, Illinois, at University of Illinois, they held a long-term selection symposium in June of 2002. And this is a picture that we took there. 
that's an, not to ramble, but another thing that I would recommend you all do is take more pictures. Because one of my regrets is, is there's not very many pictures from my time uh, running my breeding program with the people. And, um, and, and one of the messages I want to get across today to everybody is, is I've been chair for 15 years. And I rarely, when I interact with external stakeholders, rarely am I asked what I research. Or, and rarely are they really interested in research. It's not that research doesn't impact them. I don't, I don't wanna say that. Because what they remember are the people. They remember their teachers. Um, and that's why they came here, right? And, and even people with PhDs, that's usually what they wanna talk about are the people. And you know, they've long since forgotten their dissertations if they, you know, and I've pretty much forgotten about mine as well, but it's about the people in the end. And, um, and the impact of their lives. And hence, that's how, what, how this talk came to be for me anyway. But anyways, you, you all know some of these people in this slide. I don't know if I should go through them, but Mike Kern's on the left. That's me in the back. I haven't changed a bit uh, since 2002. Rex Bernardo right there in front. John Miles standing next to Dr. Dudley on the left. Um, John's a, uh, so when I was in, as an undergrad, I ended up in a class with John before I started working with him on his PhD project. I was collecting, helping write down data for him is what I was doing as an undergrad. But John and I ended up in a calculus class together. He had been in the Peace Corps and he was an older student. So that, so that was a motivator for me. I hear this older student taking calculus, right, uh, in a class that I was in. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. And there's Dr. Dudley, Lee Stromberg in the back, and of course, Rita Mum on the right, who who many of you probably know. She's running the Soybean Innovation Lab, or she's one of the, she's not running it, but she's one of the major players in the Soybean Innovation Lab at the University of Illinois. That's doing quite a bit of work in Africa, and we've been working with her lately as well. So my master's thesis was an interesting time. When I, be, when I started on my assistantship, I went up to Dr. Dudley's office and asked him what I should do. And there, there was some a lot of work to be done on the project. It was early before the field work before we were pollinating. He said, we well, should go to the library and read. So then I asked him what I should read and he gave me a list. And uh, one, of, one of the things he gave me to read was Faulkner's book, I'll never forget it. So I went and read it. And um, uh, while we were waiting around to do stuff, so that's all I did was I went to read. So one of my masters, we had a lot of time to think and read there. And I really, really appreciated that. Uh, Dudley was an excellent teacher in the classroom and, and and he sort of became a role model there. But he had some other characteristics that I observed in, in talking to him and working with him. I think he's still like this. He was a voracious reader. And, um, and that kind of rubbed off on me. And I was doing a lot of reading then too, both inside the science and outside the science, right? He was an excellent writer. He was an editor of crop science, I think, at that point in time. And, um, and, and, that, and that was another thing that I needed was a good role model. I couldn't write. Um, to save my life and um and and then he had a lot of patience and um and so so those things all came together when i when i wrote my first draft of my master's thesis I, it took me quite a while uh, we were writing on paper every other line that's how we did it didn't have computers to write it on i gave it to him i think i turned in a masterpiece and he gave it back to me and says well he says you're going to have to start over I thought, oh, geez, you know, but the good news was, was that he gave me guidance on how to do that. And he really taught me how to structure and write, write a paper. And I've, I've been appreciative of that ever since, right? He took his time to help me, to guide me through that writing process. And he had the time, I had the time, so we did it. But I left there with an interest in three things, though, uh, in plant breeding, uh, autotetrapoid genetics, an interest I've since abandoned because autotetrapoid genetics are just a pain, although they are interesting. Um, selection. <laughs> And, um, and inbreeding, inbreeding depression. Um, Dr. Dudley had done a lot of work, and part of my master's thesis was working on inbreeding and autotetrapoids. And, and John had done a, quite a bit of work on inbreeding at the time and inbreeding depression. He had some previous students that had done a bit of theory work on the topic as well, uh, which I'm not sure I still understand, but that would have been, I think, Paul Cornelius. Um, that shouldn't have come up that way. So there we go. So, um, and then I, then as I said, I did a work on a project called Mass Selection Inbreeding Depression in Three Auto Tetrapoid Maze Synthetics. And they had taken the elongate gene at the time, several years before I started on this and created and used that to, to create these auto tetrapoid maze populations. Um, they had a lot of aneuploidy. Um, they had a lot of seed set issues. So they had been selecting for seed set in them and, and that became, became part of my project, so. 
anyway, so then, um, well, and then after I, my master's, you know, I knew I had to leave. Dr. Delty wasn't going to let me stay. And uh, before I talk about Iowa State, though, I really wanted to go to North Carolina State uh, and work with Bob Mall. That's what I wanted to do. And um, so I applied down there and, well, they wouldn't let me in because my GRE scores weren't good enough. And so and I was about to retake it. I hate the GRE. I hate it to this day. And, um, and so then I had to go somewhere else. And I had applied to other places, of course, and one of them was Iowa State. And, um, and then I got an offer to, to go work there. And, um, and, um, and I had my choice between Russell and Hallauer. And I chose Dr. Hallauer mainly because of my interest in quantitative genetics and the work that he was doing. And so I got started my career there. But you'll see that he got his MS and PhD degrees at Iowa State as well. He wasn't a contemporary with, with Dr. Uh, Dudley, though. They didn't overlap at all while they were here because Dudley left in 56, remember. But Arnold had been at, Dr. Hallard had been down at K-State at the time and had an under, working for an undergrad, as an undergrad with a person there named Elmer Heine, if I remember correctly. I don't know if Arnold's on, I don't think he is. And uh, Elmer was a wheat breeder at, at uh, Kansas State, who's kind of kind of famous in the industry from that era. So I think Charlie Singh was on the call, also has a, got a legacy with Elmer, which we'll talk about in a minute. So now there's a connection between these people, right? They're all both connected to Iowa State in one way or another, and both working on quantitative genetics. So when I came here, um, it was much different than Illinois. And at first I'd wondered what I'd gotten myself into because I probably should have rephrased this, but we work like dogs in the field. You know, I think this terminology probably comes from sled dogs, right? Um, up in the North, but uh, I tell you what, it was something else. Uh, we were in the field constantly uh, working. And um, when I came here in 1982, we were planting and hand harvesting probably 30 acres a year of of research plots and nurseries. And, and everybody worked in the field. It didn't matter who you worked for. When it was time to plant or harvest, we, you all went, right? And, and it wasn't just an eight to five thing. I mean, we worked from six in the morning till, till it got dark. Um, that's, that's what we had to do to get done. And we did that. That's what we did. Arnold, if you ever get a chance to talk to Dr. Hallauer about this, um, uh, he has some personal stories about about the, the work ethic here. And that work ethic came from a person I'm gonna talk about in a minute named George Sprague. And um, but I'll come to that in a few minutes. And so, so that was different, right? And so then we had to, to study around the edges, literally, right? And you're frequently tired, but it, it, if you worked at it and drank enough coffee, uh, you could get through and do that. And we did. The whole hour had some interesting characteristics too. If I thought Dudley was a voracious reader, Hallar was, was a big reader. At the time, back then, Arnold was reading a couple of books a week, both fiction and nonfiction. I've never seen anybody read as much as him, um, and I think he's still like that. He was an excellent writer, and partly because I think he has, I've never asked him about this, but I think he has a near photographic memory. I used to use him as a, um, as a librarian, right? You go in and say, Arnold, I think I remember a paper from that someone published an X, Y, and Z, and Arnold could spit it out, literally off the top of his head. And he was a really good editor. He was like Dudley, not to uh, put pressure on the current faculty who had graduate students in the department, but if I gave Arnold something to read um, today at noon, he would have it back to me the next day. Didn't matter how long it was, because he was, because he was, he was just good at it. And, uh, and it came back edited. And, um, and in better shape than when I sent it to him. He was, he was a patient human being too. I think most plant breeders are patient who have developed cultivars because developing cultivars is a process that, well, back then it took longer than it does now, but you still have to be patient, right? So this is a picture. This picture is like something you see in a Rockwell thing or something. I was looking at it this morning when I was looking at the slides. And um, I just want to point out, so Arnold's in the center of this picture. I think this is an HP 41 CV calculator that Howie Smith had been experimenting with to collect electronic data on. Howie had left the program by the time this had gone to Corteva, but he is an ARS scientist here. I ended up actually filling the slot that he vacated. Um, that's Dave Guy on the left. He was my research technician when I was with ARS. Of course, that's me next to him, Arnold, Linda Pollock back there behind Dr. Hallar, Catherine Mongoma, 
was one of Linda's students, Jim Sears, Bill Aiken, who was also technical support on the project, and Ren Rui, who was a visiting scientist with Arnold at the time from, um, from China. So kind of a classic picture. For those of you in Agronomy Hall, this would have been, um, it would have been in the area that's at the end of the the main office hallway here where in down the area where Mark Licht is at, that area was where the corn breeding project was housed. The building looked much different then than it does now. So, um, and this is this corn breeding project circa 1987. I know these pictures don't mean much to you, but I think it's fun to share them because for a couple of reasons, because uh, some of the people in this picture have retired, which is sort of embarrassing, and I haven't. And um, but you can see me in the front on the left again is Jim Sears on the bottom row, Dave Guy, Arnold Hall, our Linda Pollock, Peter Peterson, um, who was actually Pat Snobble's major advisor. For those of you who want to know, uh, Bill Russell, who developed B seventy three, myself, Mary Lentz, who was staff support. Mary just retired from animal science. Um, Dana Erb and Paul White, who actually was my technician when I became state, became Jin Ming's technician, and now is retired and still working for Jin Ming and in retirement. So no one ever retires. Like, for example, in that back row, row in the middle there, kind of behind Linda Pollock's Don Blackburn. And so Don Blackburn moved fairly high up in the Dow hierarchy. And I could go through some of the other ones, but we won't spend much time on that. So and some of the students there were from. Um, um, other projects. This is a picture of some people you might know, some of you may know better, uh, maybe not, I don't know, I shouldn't say stuff like that, I don't know what anybody knows, but at my program circa 2002, a couple things to, to point out um, in the pictures, first right in the middle is Jim Rouse, so he was one of my PhD students, probably a lot of you in the corn program know him, um, and, um, and then uh, behind the woman in the red sweater on the in front of Jim is S. Chizbu Paul Kansengmi. She's one of my Thai students. Is um, Chris Rasmussen, who I think works for Corteva still. Uh, Clint Turnbull is one of my former PhD students. He works for Corteva. In the back row is Brandon Wardine. Uh, he's a breeder for Corteva out in Nebraska. Uh, J.D. Rousseau is on the right. J.D had come to visit with me. You want to get a PhD with me here. JD's now the, I think the, the worldwide director of vegetable breeding at um, Corteva, but not vegetable breeding, but crops other than corn and soybeans, but not vegetables. And that's his wife sitting in front of him. And that's Lori Hensey next to Jim Rouse. She's a cotton breeder uh, with ARS down in Texas now. And so, um, but back to JD, but he had come here from Monsanto and took, spent a semester here with us and took a couple of classes and his intent was to get a PhD at Iowa State, but Monsanto wasn't really willing to spend the money or cut him loose. He was based in South Africa. So I worked with JD at that time to get a PhD in South Africa. He got a PhD from the University of the Free State. I directed his research project, went down there a couple of times. So it was kind of a cool project. Uh, he was uh, kind of in the line to report to Ted Crosby at the time, uh, who was running the breeding programs there. So I wanna talk, it's a history about the corn breeding project. This is the 100th anniversary of it. And I, these are new slides. I didn't include these in the original talk. I have a lot of respect for these people. I'm kind of a buff fan of the history of corn breeding a little bit. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but Merle Jenkins um, founded the corn breeding program at Iowa State University in 1922. Um, and, um, and this photo came out of the Smithsonian Archives. It's a really good photo of him. I, did, I didn't know him, so I don't wanna imply that, but it's just a good photo. Um, so he came here and founded the original corn breeding in 1922. And we'll come to the Iowa State's role in corn breeding, but for many years, the program, the corn breeding program in Iowa State was entirely an ARS program. And, and hence the ARS colleagues that we have in the building. Uh, and that's a legacy thing from then. There's a lot of ARS scientists. Um, but the important thing about Merle Jenkins is, is that he developed a lot of the inbred lines out of original pollinated varieties that gave rise essentially to the double cross era of maize production in the United States. Hybrids like, like um, gosh, I'm going to forget their names anymore. There's a couple of US 13 and there's, a, there's a Iowa, several Iowa hybrids like Iowa 949 and others that were widely grown in the Corn Belt. And they had his inbreds in them from the first sampling of inbreds out of open pollinated varieties, at least in the public sector. There was people back then also starting to self out of 
open pollinated varieties because that's all they had uh, in the private sector as well. Uh, I think Jenkins left at some point in time and went to the, he was a federal employee, of, it's then called the Science and Education Agency, he went to DC and, um, and they brought in, well actually I want one more thing about Jenkins, I forgot about this. This is one of my favorite old corn breeding papers. I, I think everybody who's in corn should read it if they haven't. It's in the 1936 yearbook of agriculture. It's called Crop Improvement by Merle Jenkins. Um, and it kind of lays out the state of corn breeding at that time in the United States. It's a long chapter, has lots of details in it, lists all the open pollinated varieties that were being offered or that were the big ones anyway at that time. Uh, but one of my favorite things in this comes from page 461. And this has always had a big impact on me and influenced some of the things I did. He goes, he talks about the fact that varietal names of corn mean less than those of almost any other field crop because corn's cross-pollinated. I'm not gonna read all of this to you. Um, um, and then he goes on later on, I'll come back to talk about that. He says, and in fact, it's often been shown in yield trials that there may be larger differences among strains within varieties than between varieties. So what do you suppose that is? Um, I was trying to find a quote by another guy named F.D. Ritchie, who was leading up serial investigations at the time with the Science and Education Agency. But what he's talking about is, is that, because Ritchie had a quote that goes something like, I can't find it, that if you want good corn on your farm back during this OP era, that you had to make sure your neighbors had good corn too, because it was cross-pollinating. And, um, and then, then what these farmers tended to do back then, and you see this with sweet corn cultivars being sold on the roadside stand, uh, they call it salt and pepper, but no one's growing the salt and pepper cultivar. It was a real cultivar. They're growing something else, but everybody knows it is that. They named their varieties whatever was selling. Plus they were crossing with everything that was around them, right? There was more corn acres in the US back then than there is now, particularly in the Northeast. So a lot of these cultivars intercrossed. And so the names became more or less meaningful, meaningless. Uh, we went on and um, before I get to that, you know, that led me to work on that and some other things led me to do a little bit of corn diversity work, which I vowed never to do again for a whole bunch of reasons, because diversity is really, really hard to define, right? But it turns out we did some work on some of these open pollinated varieties that were saved in the, uh, in the uh, PI station here in town and showed that in fact, they had very low FST values and there wasn't much structure among those. Um, There's typically as much variation within those varieties as there was between them, which is pretty much what Jenkins said here in this paper in 1936. So, so you know, he already knew that without looking at marker stuff. So um, we got to show that that was in fact true. Um, my favorite writer of all time in corn breeding, I think one of the best writers I've read in corn breeding was George Sprague. Uh, he's the guy under the red arrow. Um, it's worth introducing to you to all these white guys in this photo. Um, I'm gonna do it because they're all pretty famous people, at least for me. The guy in the bottom right um, setting down is John Lawnen. And John Lawnen discovered the shrunken two gene, which gave rise to the super sweet sweet corns. Uh, which I think it was a product that came out of the University of Illinois. He was, a, he was a maize geneticist there. The guy behind him on the right, I'm going backwards here, is Denton Alexander. He's, he did a lot of early work on, on high oil corn and was part of the long-term protein and oil experiments at Illinois. The guy in the middle passed away young. He was Art Hooker. He was a famous maize pathologist at the time. Bob Lambert on the left, who's, who uh, took my first plant breeding class. Bob passed away recently too. Earl Hooker standing to the left of George Sprague, Earl, not Earl Hooker, Earl uh, Patterson. Earl ran the maize genetic co-op at University of Illinois, where they saved all the genetic stocks. The guy was a fountain of information, and he knew just about everything, and then Sprague and then John Dudley to his right. So, so we typically consider Sprague to be the founder, the grandfather of the corn breeding program here, but technically it was Jenkins. Um, and um, Sprague left the program here in 1958 and went to the USDA to head up the serial investigations unit as an administrator. And that, and, and that had been about the time then Arnold was finishing his PhD degree and got hired a few years later by Sprague uh, to, to become an ARS scientist here. There are other ARS scientists here at the time too, not just, not just Dr. Hallauer. Uh, but Sprague's a, a great writer. 
And I tell people he's kind of like the uh, fisher of statistics. The saying in statistics is, is that if you have an idea in statistics, Fisher probably already thought about it and wrote it down somewhere, but maybe couldn't do it because you didn't have the computational capabilities. Well, the same thing's true in corn breeding. Now, the thing about Sprague was is he was an excellent biologist. Uh, he was a top-notch biologist, and many of his early papers were on biology, and he finished his career working on transposable elements, right? Uh, he spent most of his time when I was at the University of Illinois, he was retired, um, um, uh, working on transposable element stuff, and so, but the big thing about Sprague I want to point out is, is that he was probably the first person, he was here with Jay Lush, right, so Jay Lush was, who was the animal breeder that Lush Hall across the streets named after, was considered one of the first people who was really able to translate what people like Fisher and Sewell Wright and JBS Haldane was doing into understandable stuff for plant breeders. I said that probably in a poor way, and I think Sprague was probably the first person who wasn't trained as a quantitative genetics to really, really understand the theory. Sprague never did theory, but he understood the theory, and he was able to write about it well, and, um, and ran a lot of, I thought, really cool experiments that were based on the theory back in the day on things like dominance and overdominance, and so. So my other big claim to fame is that I got, I'm the only I think I'm the only plant breeder that's got, who's both, whose major advisors are both on tequila shot glasses. And um, this would be so much better to do in person. I apologize. I was hoping I could do this in person. <clears throat> but anyway, we held, there's two international symposiums on plant breeding. Unfortunately, they ended after two. They should have, I wish we could have kept it going, but those things are hard to keep going. The first one was an honor of Hall Hour, and the second was an honor of John Dudley. Ted Crosby, who's passed away now, had a lot to do with the organization of both of those uh, symposiums, as did our friends down at Summit. <clears throat> so I just want to say that. I want to say one more thing, um, and this kind of relates back to agronomy. This is an interesting picture, right? So so um, the guy on the left, uh, Dr. Russell, the developer of B73 and a bunch of other inbreds here at Iowa State. And those inbreds came out of federal germplasm. Right behind Dr. Russell is Pat Snobble. You guys all know Pat. And uh, Pat and I were contemporaries in graduate school. Pat and I and Bill Beavis were in graduate school together, just for the record. Um, uh, next to Pat in the back, there's Dick Johnson. I got to know Dick Johnson as a graduate student at the University of Illinois. Uh, he was brilliant. So, you know, this is an example about him. And then before I go on to that, and then there's Ken Fry standing right up here in front, who was actually Dick's advisor. And Ken, I think Dick might have been one of Ken's, also Jim, um, no, take that back. He, I think Ken um, might have, Dick might have been Ken's first graduate student. I don't know. But, uh, but Dick uh, was an outstanding quantitative geneticist theoretician. And um, like, I, I remember back when Eric Lander developed MapMaker, right? MapMaker QTL particularly. Uh, Dick had programmed that in SAS uh, probably before two days were over, right? So, he, so Dick, he's working at DeKalb um, and doing this kind of stuff. Dick had an outstanding corn breeding program. He could put a lot of hybrids on the market, but he spent most of his time thinking, what I remember about him and what I liked about Dick is Dick went to the University of Illinois library probably twice a week and spent a day there reading two days a week. And he was reading back then mostly psychology literature and statistics because he was interested in how to apply new statistical methodologies into things. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Jin Ming. Jin Ming does this too. I think this is a really cool thing. And probably some of the rest of you do too, but I know Dick and Jin Ming really well. I'm not saying the rest of you aren't doing it. I'm just saying, I think this is something. I, and, and, um, um, but the other cool thing, the reason this picture was taken is, is that Dick left us, bequeathed us, he hasn't passed away yet, he's still living in Champaign-Urbana area, uh, left us money to endow the department chair position in agronomy, and he wanted it named after Bill Russell. And, and I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, that's, that's just one of these things. It's a connection thing, right? And so, would he have done that if I had, had I not been chair? I don't know. Uh, I just don't know, and um, but I've hung out with Dick a lot over the years, and and Dick's not on the call. I don't. I'm pretty sure, but um, but Dick was an interesting human being. Talk to Jody Edwards about him sometime. Dick and Jody worked together for a while at DeKalb. Smart guy. This guy is on the call. So a lot of things have influenced how I think, and you could argue about that. But this gentleman here on, on my left, uh, I don't know when this picture was taken. His name's Charlie Singh. 
So I met Charlie Singh at a popcorn field day up at the Moose Lodge north of Ames. We were waiting in line together, me and him and Ken Ziegler, to um, get food after the field day we'd had at the, I can't remember their name now, at the, uh, pop, there's a popcorn breeding place up where Alluvial is now. And, uh, and, and Charlie has a connection back to Iowa State. He's from Northern Illinois originally, he got his BS degree here in 1960. And um, then he went on to get a, a master's degree with Elmer Heine in plant breeding at um, Kansas State. I remember I mentioned Elmer before because Elmer had an influence on Arnold. And then he got his PhD at North Carolina State with Bob Mall, the person I want to get my PhD with. And uh, I had a lot of respect for Bob Mall and what he had been writing back then. And not only that, uh, Charlie had worked on inbreeding. In fact, did one of the best early inbreeding depression studies in Mays, in my humble opinion. And they got to work with Warren Hansen. I don't know how many, probably most of you don't know who Warren is. Um, I'm sure Jim Holland does. He's probably a legend at North Carolina State. And, uh, but Warren was a, Warren thought geometrically. If you read his papers, you know, it's a, it's a different kind of a beast. And uh, Charlie and I have become really good friends. In fact, I spent an hour on the phone with him this morning. Uh, we, he, but Charlie went on after he graduated North Carolina State to become one of the first human geneticists hired at, at the University of Michigan Department of Genetics. So here's a corn breeder, wheat breeder, agronomy guy at Iowa State who went on to be a human geneticist. Spent his career working on a lot of things, but Charlie, I'm gonna say you worked on hypertension and um, coronary heart disease, quantitative genetics of that. And I had seen Charlie talk at one of the early, um, at one of the early um, uh, Gordon conferences on quantitative genetics that were held. He's one of the early speakers at that conference. And Alan Templeton is one of his PhD students. And I think Alan's, um, I've, Alan used to, has retired from Washington University. And I think Alan's one of the best um, population genesis I've ever met. He's also a lucid uh, speaker and um, in his own right. This is taken at Montana at a guest ranch and Charlie used to, every other year was hosting ag and um, um, he'd bring agriculture people and medical people together down at this Montana place as invite only thing. It was a small group of people, maybe 30, 40 people. And we sat around and hash out philosophical things uh, related to ag and medicine. There's a lot of overlap between ag and medicine. Like I was talking to um, uh, Jim Holland a few minutes ago about Charlie Brummer. For example, Charlie Brummer and I used to go down there together quite a bit. Matt Liebman went a, a fair bit too. So, But Charlie's had a lot of influence on me. I think this connection he's, he's made with me between medicine and ag has had a lot of influence on how I think about the world, which has had a lot of influence on what I've done as a department chair. And so, uh, so I think that's important. And Charlie's also an accomplished popcorn breeder. Uh, on the side, and he got Elmer Heine's, he got some germplasm from Elmer Heine when he passed away, and Charlie's got inbred lines in production, in hybrid production, which is something that I can't lay claim to. I developed inbred lines, but none of them made it to production to my knowledge, and so, and, um, and then, you know, and then the other connection with Charlie I mentioned earlier is the inbreeding thing, and, and I, I'm going to talk about this study, I think next is, is about, you know, we Jody and I worked on the quantitative genetics of inbreeding, which had been something that had been a big interest of mine for quite some time. But, but two other people I met down through Charlie were these two gentlemen at the Montana thing that had a big influence on me as well. The one on the left's Wendell Berry. Uh, I was taught in my undergrad class the other day and he, Wendell, Wendell's written a lot. Wendell's a really, really good writer and he's written fiction. He's a poet by, by training. He's a farmer down in, um, in Kentucky. And, um, and he's been a critic of ag. And I think that's good, right? And so but he, Wendell wrote a book called The Unsettling of America, Culture and Agriculture, which I think everybody in ag in the US should probably have a read at. You don't have to agree with it, but you should read it. And on Charlie's right is Wes Jackson, who founded the Land Institute down in uh, near Salinas, Kansas. And Wes has been a big thinker, a big proponent of polycultures and things like that. And a former student that I was in school with named Stan Cox is now a person who's been working with Wes for quite some time down there. And, and these, these gentlemen are all getting up in age. But, um, but anyway, so, but, so this is an influential group, right? And people who spend a lot of time thinking. And uh, so that's been a big plus to me. 
I'm probably running out of time. I need to move on. So Jin Ming mentioned my graduate students. They're all here. You know, the graduate students are the things that gave me pleasure during my career. Um, they're also the things that gave me frustrations during my career. And so uh, most of those frustrations were around how I started this thing at writing, right? I mean, people always tell me, oh, when will you finish? And I go, well, it depends on how well you write. I said, I, no one's ever suffered from data collection. It's always from writing. So I'm not going to talk about all of them because there's not time. I am going to mention a few things. Um, I work primarily on population improvement, selection response, epistasis, inbreeding, inbreeding depression, heterosis. I have some regrets uh, about what I did during my career. Maybe we can chat about those in the... Um, uh, not on working on these things, but I think this we made some philosophical decisions that I think were were not well reasoned at the time, and but I think that's normal in that thing. Um, a lot of work with Iowa stiff stalk synthetic. It was developed by George Sprague. Actually, he made the original crosses when he was down at the University of, of Missouri as an ARS scientist. Um, at population put out lots of important inbreds. Um, in fact, this pretty much is what most of the females in the hybrid screw in the U.S. still are related to today. Um, it didn't respond to inbred progeny selection, which made it unique. It responded very well to reciprocal selection. This had added a variance and dominance variance were equal in this population, the cycle zero, which is very unusual because in old pollinated varieties, the additive variance is usually double the dominance variance. So that made it unique. <clears throat> we do selection in it. The additive variance doesn't decrease, even though the population is quite inbred now. Um, Reciprocal recurrent selection did significantly reduce the dominance variance in the population. And as Jody was able to show in his PhD thesis, uh, we were able to finally explain some of these things, at least a little bit, that has this unique variance component structure associated with it. Um, I, I, I used Jody as an example grad student because the question was always how to get students engaged in, in, in the design of research projects, especially in corn breeding, if we're doing field work, right? It takes so long. When Jody came, he wanted to work on epistasis. I did too, but we didn't have anything even close to being able to get ready to work on any serious experiment in epistasis, which is really difficult. So, we, so I told him, I think we should work on inbreeding, depression and inbreeding. And so, so we started doing that. And, and Jody started running simulation models on the genetic design of the experiment. And these ended up really paying off. And I think he ended up extending and applying some new theory around inbreeding. We grew a really large experiment um, at the time. It's still pretty large, I think, by today's standards, where we had 200 lines that we grew in each of five generations, um, the SOs, S1s, S2s, S3s, and S4s. We came up with a novel way of trying to get a measure of the SO performance for each of the individual um, um, lines of descent in this, right? Usually you can, people would grow the S1s, S2s, and S3s because they couldn't reproduce, figure out how to measure the SO. But what we did was we took the S1 plants, <coughs> S, S1 families, and grew them in isolation with the original population and it harvested the seed. And at least genetically, it should represent the performance of the original SO plant as a way to get back at estimating that. No one's ever challenged us on that. And I think it worked out really well. And, it, and we hadn't used a novel experimental design in this experiment as well, but it paid off. It was worth the time and effort. It took a while. Um, I was wrong about almost everything that I knew about inbreeding. Jody and I would argue profusely about a lot of this stuff. I was convinced I could estimate the variance of F, which was kind of the holy grail uh, from this experiment, but it turned out that the rate of inbreeding is confounded with the SO breeding value. Um, it's kind of the higher, you, the higher you perform, the farther you have the fall in inbreeding problem, so to speak. The other thing that happened that we learned in his study, though, was that stiff stalk had this negative covariance between the, um, the breeding values of SO individuals and the dominance deviations of, of homozygous individuals. I think I said that right. Jody can correct me later if I'm wrong, which leads to lower variance among inbred progeny. Uh, inbred progeny breeding values, and hence this fact that it wouldn't respond to inbred progeny selection. This is important because back in that time, a lot of people were promoting inbred progeny selection because of additive effects. We had a lot of fun. Uh, we spent a lot of time working on heterosis theory. It was a heterosis conference that I think was held in 1998 in Mexico. And, um, and I, um, I was hell bent to try to, because everybody kept saying they still do, that heterosis is the foundation of modern hybrid breeding. And, and, 
and and I think people are using the word loosely, but I don't personally believe that statement. And um, and so heterosis is important. Um, and I'm going to try to explain to you why. Just a couple of facts about heterosis. There's been a paper published in an economic research journal. I guess I forgot to put the reference on here. I apologize. I did this in a hurry this morning. Um, but this is yield trial data from, um, from Iowa, actually. Uh, from I can't remember the period of time. They don't have it in the table header. From about 1922 through 1938 in that range, where they summarized the hybrid yield uh, per acre the mean standard deviation min and max and the open pollinated min and max. And so it's, it's, I think there's been a myth going around that these early hybrids significantly out yielded um, open pollinated varieties, they didn't. They out yielded them a little bit on the average here, as you can see, about, about, about 11 bushels, 10 bushels or so on the average, which is a lot, but you'll also see that there's, and everybody thinks all the open pollinated varieties back in 1934 or before we're only yielding 34 bushels, but that's not true either. There's a lot of high performing oak pollinated varieties and they were had oak pollinated varieties that were doing 90 bushels an acre. And so that makes a lot of sense, right? Because we we're in person, I teach this like a class, but on the average, the heterosis in an oak pollinated variety is zero um, because heterosis theory comes out of population theory. It's a population concept. And, and then on these early hybrids, there were only, you know, maybe one standard deviation from the mean uh, of the original pollinated variety. This is something I think Dick Lewinton got wrong too. He was a big proponent that this, we could have done this with open pollinated varieties, uh, but we can always do better. Uh, and, and, the, and the reason for this traces back to Shaw's original concept of, um, of uh, heterosis and hybrids. I probably don't have enough time to do this justice today, but Shaw's original paper, you know, was just published where he invented hybrids, at least the concept of hybrids. Uh, he goes, the and this is before Men Mendelian genetics had been rediscovered. Uh, the obvious conclusion we reached is that ordinary cornfield is a series of very complex hybrids produced by a combination of numerous elementary species. Self-fertilization soon eliminates the hybrid elements and they're used to strain to its elementary components. Well, what does that mean? That was his way of saying it was that every plant in the field of oak pollinated variety is an F1 hybrid. <clears throat> and, and so, um, right, that's what they are. It's, it's just like two different random gametes have come together to form a hybrid. All of us in this on this call are F1 hybrids. The problem with us and the individual corn plants and open pollinated variety is, is that you can't reproduce it unless you're an apomictic species, right? I mean, all apple cultivars are F1 hybrids for the most part, but they don't reproduce them from, uh, from seed. And, um, and so then he, he came up with this thought experiment that found out, well, if you self an infinite number of plants and open pollinated variety of homozygosity, it fixes the gametes in the population and the inbred lines. And if you were to take those inbred lines and recreate the population, you could restore it to its original state. So then inbred lines became this way of, of trying to find the gamete that exists in that best inbred plant, right? That best hybrid plant in the open pollinated variety, which is what all the complexity in corn breeding is about. That's literally what it's all about, in my humble opinion. Yeah, so then the difference between the performance of the inbred and the performance of the hybrid is heterosis, but it's not the heterosis that I think people, that's not why hybrids, F1 hybrids yield so much. And so anyway, so the question now I'm gonna get done is did it all matter? I, I think it did, I don't know. I can't remember what I said in the original talk. This is my a summary of my top 10 most cited papers, but who cares? And, um, and so it's, it's nice that people are reading some of the stuff and we made a contribution. It's the people we touch that really matter. Um, I put this slide together a long time ago. I'm wrapping up now. I, I think, you know, we tend to be really focused on new technology. And new technology is at the top of the pile of importance. Um, and, um, and I think germplasm and these other things are at the bottom of this pile. And I, if you disagree, that's fine. I don't, doesn't matter. Um, and um, I like to end this, this quote from a paper by Ernst Mayer in PNAS in 1997. Um, it's tough to say this given all the genomics technology that's been applied to plant breeding, but I think one needs to ask why it's been applied at some point in time. So I think we've learned from it, I'm not saying that, but, but Ernst writes a paper on selection 
he's an evolutionary biologist. A uh, bit of the papers about group selection, I think it's worth reading. But he goes, when reading my analysis, I was quite surprised how rarely I had to refer to the genetic aspects responsible for the phenotype. Apparently, it does not matter very much how the genes are combined or how much the genotype has to be modified, providing the resulting phenotype is favored by selection. What counts is the adaptiveness of the end product. What I think he's saying is, is, I call it the many roads to Toledo problem, right? So if you want to drive to Toledo today, there's lots of different ways you could go. The objective is just to get to Toledo. It doesn't matter which way you go. I think that's the point here, right? He's essentially saying that we're picking adaptiveness on this big landscape, you know, like, like Sewell Wright used to talk about. It's probably an epistatic landscape. And there's multiple ways to 200 bushel corn. And, and, and we still don't understand how we get the 200 bushel corn, even with genomics, right? And so I think this is a really, really important thing. And, and in the end, it's the adaptiveness of the product. And you can only figure that out by measuring the phenotype um, in the thing. So I'm gonna stop there. I talked way too long. I apologize, Chin Ming. And so, um, and um, see if there are questions, comments, or booze. Excellent. We have enough time for all the questions, and then we have a extended discussion, right, starting at uh, four o'clock. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Everybody is uh, clicking the, you know. I still applauding. I share my. I did unshare it. Very good. Yes, you did. Yeah. I saw Madan is ready to ask a question. Go ahead, Madan. Well, I just want to know how. People used to get PhD in one year, whereas you take three to seven years now, six years. Well, and I didn't get my PhD in one year. Um, I, I think, so, so, so I came here in 82 and I finished my PhD in 85. So it, I took, it took three years. Before that, your professors were all one year or two years. Um, they got masters in two years, then one year for PhD. I guess this is a continuum of three years. Oh, you mean for Dudley and Hallower? Yeah, they have, Hallower got it in two years. Dudley got it in one year. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't remember much about either one of them's original PhD project, but my guess is is that they, um, um, same project probably. Well, they they had consecutive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, maybe they were smarter back then. I don't know. I'm just, I, I'm, that's a joke. I'm just kidding, right? I don't, I don't. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank, very nice talk. Thank you so much for that historical uh, mm -hmm. part of the talk. It was really nice to know all the history about it. Very nice. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Amadon. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, ask questions, especially you're in a hurry to leave. Uh, if not, I, I know there is always a dedicated group to stay. Uh, after longer discussions, yeah. Okay, no, I can start uh, by your uh, diagram uh, you showed about the germ plasma, the you know, base breeding methodology, and then piling up to the new technology. Uh, what was that was just mainly because you know most of the lower layer work has been well established or do you think that uh, the you know breeding companies or you know breeding program are still want us to research on those uh you know those uh, layers that uh, probably have longer time to establish or well i i, I guess my point of, of so actually there's two points i think i can make about that slide i think they're important i, I think for, for one thing um um the um i, I think germplasm still is the the thing that's a primary it's important is even in modern commercial programs, right? I think what's changed though with time is, is where that germplasm knowledge resides. And I think that's something we don't think very much, right? So back up until about the time I started in the business, a lot of the germplasm knowledge resided in the public sector. And a lot of it was coming from the public sector. And, uh, and then that's shifted now, right? And, and the germplasm's gotten proprietary and we were given everything around. So remember, you know, B73 by Mo 17 at its peak was grown on what? 15 to 20% of the US maize acreage. And uh, what do we get out of that here? Not a dime, right? It was a 
given as a public good. In fact, you know, it probably helped a lot of seed companies, right? A lot of them didn't want it, I don't think, but the but it brought this performance boost. It's interesting that the hybrid was extremely susceptible to European corn borer. Um, we use B73 as a susceptible check, the European corn borer. Uh, but the performance and the seed production of B73, I, th I think were, 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 were good. So I think that's one point. The other point I didn't make, I think that the thing that, you know, about the time I went to graduate school, um, uh, you know, the co conversations about transgenes were starting to come on, how this is going to revolutionize plant breeding. And, you know, and a lot of people are running around saying it's going to put plant breeding out of business at that time, right? Well, you know, that didn't happen. But I think the point I want to make about that is a personal point, not a, not a point about the program is, is that we... A lot of us bet against the technology. And um, that's the one thing I learned from Dick Johnson. You know, I was, we used to have a, I used to talk to him a lot of time talking to him. And this is my current philosophy, never bet against technology. And a lot of people were betting against technology. And, um, but I think that's a lot of that had to do with how the conversation was going on. Um, but I try not to bet against technology. Um, I don't believe everything I hear, but yeah. But I think germplasm and breeding methodology, you know, stuff's become routine and they've been able to automate all that, right? And so I think um, the question is, that I ask people in the industry now, and it's a tough question to answer, I think, I don't think most people want to answer, what is the cost per unit genetic gain in corn? What, are, what is the spend? And I think the corollary to that question is, is, is it worth it? Um, do we really, what do we need to keep doing in corn? Do we really need to keep increasing yield or maintain its adaptation? Or, and are those things different? I, I, I don't know. I think those are the interesting questions to me, so. Thank you. Uh, Jim Holland and then Charlie Singh. Distinguished guests have any questions or comments to make? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for inviting me. That was good. Um, it was uh, good to see all the history. Good to see all the, the old the old dudes there at Iowa State. Um, I guess uh, I guess a question I had is any you know going back to this thing about the stiff stock synthetic having these sort of special characteristics, um, which you know seem to underlie its somewhat unusual kind of breeding behavior. I guess going back, why that population? What, why that population and not other populations? That's, that's a great question, Jim. Um, I wish I knew the answer to that question. I don't know if anybody else knows the answer to that question or not. And I, so I think that's, that's among the things we still don't really understand is these, these gen, how these genetic architectures get formed. And, um, and, and then, you know, and then that, that, that raised a lot of the question you always spend a lot of time thinking about when you do population improvement is, is that really the best way to develop inbred lines? Well, I think the answer to that is probably clearly no. Although it did crank out some good inbred lines because an entire industries, you know, through practice, I'd say primarily is built around using um, populations with effective size of two. And, um, and I, I think, I personally think those programs take a lot of advantage of genetic drift. Um, because they're sampling lots of F2s that are very small number size within each of them. And so it's and genetic drifts a really powerful force. But yeah, I think the unique architecture of that population is a mystery to me. Um, I don't have an explanation for it. Um, I don't know if anybody else does. I don't know if Jody has any thoughts on that. But do um, um, you have any thoughts on it, Jim? I mean, yeah, as many thoughts on it as I do. Uh, I, I, I don't know either. It's, it's always struck me as... as it's peculiar that probably the single most important population historically for corn breeding in the world has these special characteristics. Yes, and, it is peculiar. Uh, and is that, you know, is that coincidence? It, I'm guessing it's not, but, it, but then how did it come about? I mean, that's, I don't know. Again, a good, right? Did Sprague actually develop it? Is that correct? Yeah, he did, yeah. So something about those inbreds he picked. Could be the inbreds. It could be how he mated them together. But of course, it's been random mated a lot since then. So you think any founder effect would be long since disappeared. But it has persisted that genetic architecture despite all of its reproductive history. So 
Thanks. No, you're welcome. Thanks for asking that question. I mean, no one's interested in these questions anymore, I don't think, but. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm now in the old dude category. <laughs> <laughs> I just thanking you for asking the question of an old dude, Jim. So, um. okay, uh, if you haven't, you know, if not uh, willing to stay, you can go ahead and log off. But uh, I know some of us will stay for longer discussions. Uh, thank you for Dr. Kendalamki. Stay, you know, allocate time to have a good discussion. Uh